Steel thunders forward, and what stands between a 200-ton locomotive and disaster is not the romantic word, cowcatcher. One wrong term, one misunderstood piece of engineering, and catastrophe follows. If you want to know how the real structure at the front, known to railroaders as the pilot, decides who survives on the rails, subscribe now. Before the invention that changed everything, a single stray animal could mean the end of an engine, a crew, or an entire legend. What did the original front end really do, and why was getting its name right a matter of life or death? On the frontier rails of mid-19th century America, trains faced a world without fences. Cattle, bison, and wild horses wandered across the tracks, unbothered by whistles or the distant thunder of iron wheels. In this unpredictable landscape, the earliest locomotives carried their most vulnerable machinery. Cylinders, rods, and delicate valve gear just inches from the ground and right at the front. Even a single collision with a stray animal could cripple an engine, splinter a wooden frame, or endanger the crew. To protect these fragile parts, railroad builders mounted a distinctive structure at the locomotive's nose. Professionals called it the pilot. The pilot is not a net or a basket, but a rigid angled frame designed to push aside whatever stood in the train's path. Its heart is the pilot beam, a heavy transverse timber or iron bar that anchors the entire assembly and channels the shock of impact into the locomotive's main frame. Just behind, the pilot truck, a swiveling set of wheels, guides the engine into curves and helps keep it stable at speed. Each part has a precise name and a critical role. Photographs from the era show long, slatted wooden pilots, their bars sweeping outward and downward, reinforced with iron straps. These were never meant to catch anything. Instead, they nudged livestock, logs, and debris away from the rails, deflecting danger before it could reach the wheels or the exposed running gear. The geometry was deliberate, a low slope to guide obstacles down and to the side, open slats to avoid trapping bodies underneath. On open range, where a herd of cattle could appear without warning, the pilot's job was not to dominate the land, but to adapt to it, to clear a path through chaos, sparing the machinery and the men behind it. Every inch of space ahead of the wheels mattered. The pilot stood as the first and only shield between the locomotive's vital organs and the unpredictable hazards of the American frontier. By the 1870s, the open space between a locomotive's pilot and its first car was more than just a matter of style. It was dictated by the link and pin coupler, a crude system that forced brakemen to risk their lives as they stepped between moving cars to drop a metal pin into a loose link. The gap it required left room for those long, sweeping wooden pilots, but at a terrible human cost. Every year, thousands of railroad workers suffered crushed hands, mangled limbs, or worse, just to keep trains moving. In 1873, Eli H. Janney, a former Confederate officer turned dry goods clerk, patented a new kind of coupler. His invention, the knuckle coupler, locked automatically when cars came together. No more hands between the cars, no more standing in the path of rolling steel. Janney's design not only changed how trains connected, it changed the very shape of the locomotive's front end. The new coupler was shorter, stronger, and demanded a tighter fit between engine and car. Suddenly, there was no room for a long, dramatic pilot. The geometry of safety had shifted. Congress took notice. In 1893, the Safety Appliance Act made automatic couplers and air brakes the law for interstate railroads. The hearings were filled with testimony. Railroad executives worried about the cost, and labor leaders pointed to the staggering injury rates. The numbers were clear. Before the act, coupling accidents killed or maimed thousands. After the act, the toll dropped sharply. But the law did more than protect workers. By requiring janny type couplers, it forced railroads to rethink the entire front of the locomotive. Pilots grew shorter, more compact, and much stronger, no longer made of wood, but of steel. The era of the theatrical slatted pilot was over. 
In its place stood a new kind of shield, built for a world where speed and safety were now inseparable. Steel became the new language of survival at the front of the locomotive. By the early 20th century, the wooden pilots that once swept the rails had been replaced by dense frameworks of riveted bars, welded plates, and on some lines, entire grids built from discarded boiler tubes. In railroad shops, nothing went to waste. Old boiler flues, cut, cleaned, and welded became the bones of new pilots. Their cylindrical forms braced to absorb the first shock of whatever the rails delivered. For the mechanical departments, every design was a wager against disaster. The stakes had changed. Locomotives grew heavier, trains ran faster, and the gentle nudge of wood no longer offered enough protection. Riveted steel pilots, bolted directly to the pilot beam, could take a blow that would have shattered timber. Their faces were often scarred by dents and patches, visible in museum galleries today. Silent records of impacts with rocks, logs, and the occasional automobile left stranded on a crossing. Each repair told its own story, a bent bar straightened, a cracked plate welded, a patch riveted over torn metal. These were not cosmetic fixes. They were the difference between a locomotive returning to service or being sidelined for weeks between a missed schedule and a catastrophic wreck. On the fastest passenger lines, the demands grew even more severe. Some railroads cast their pilots in a single piece of steel, massive, seamless, and brutally overbuilt. These cast noses were engineered to withstand debris strikes at speeds nearing 100 miles per hour. The cost was enormous, but the alternative was unthinkable. A twisted frame, shattered running gear, or worse, a train off the rails. Every design decision was rooted in hard experience. The pilot had to be strong enough to force obstacles down and away, yet sacrificial enough to deform before damage reached the cylinders or the pilot truck just behind. In the end, the steel pilot became a kind of armor, pragmatic, battered, and utterly essential. Its scars remain, not as decoration, but as proof of a brutal calculus. Better to break the nose than lose the train. A freight locomotive weighing nearly 200 tons barrels through a mountain pass at 35 miles per hour. Its momentum unstoppable. Its purpose clear. Rounding a blind curve, a rock no bigger than a barrel but dense and immovable sits squarely on the rail. There is no time for breaks, no chance for the crew to react. In that instant, everything rides on the structure fixed to the locomotive's nose. The pilot meets the stone first. The collision unfolds in a fraction of a second, but in engineering terms, it is a brutal negotiation between mass, speed, and steel. The sloped face of the pilot does not try to catch or cradle the rock. Instead, it delivers a sharp downward blow, forcing the obstacle into the ballast or out toward the right of way. The force of impact, measured in tons and delivered over milliseconds, travels through the pilot face and into the pilot beam, the heavy crossmember just behind. This beam absorbs the initial shock, bending slightly but holding firm. The load then flows into the main frame, where the locomotive's immense weight presses down, anchoring the entire structure to the rails. The pilot truck reacts instantly, its springs compress, distributing the force across the rails and preventing the front of the locomotive from lifting or yawing. If the geometry is right, if the pilot face is low enough, the beam strong enough, and the truck properly aligned, the locomotive rides over the debris. The wheels stay guided by the rails, not thrown off by the impact. In this moment, the kinetic energy is staggering. A 200-ton train at 35 miles per hour carries as much energy as a loaded semi-truck dropped from a five-story building. The pilot's job is not to absorb all that energy, but to control how it enters the locomotive. By forcing the rock down and away, the pilot transforms a potential derailment into a repairable dent. The pilot beam bends, sometimes permanently. The truck may need inspection but the train stays on the rails, the crew survives, and the freight keeps moving. This is not luck. 
It is the result of hard-won engineering. Each component designed to take the hit so the rest of the machine and everyone behind it can continue their journey. Every high-speed train today still relies on the brutal logic of the pilot. Deflect, survive, keep moving. As rail traffic grows and obstacles evolve, these unseen structures remain the first and last defense against disaster. Progress is measured in what never derails. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts below.